salvation, me to forgiveness. Hello, family. I am so excited to be with you. And this is going to be, I believe, an extraordinary conversation because we have extraordinary people with us. These gentlemen are none other than the Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby and the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, both senior pastors, both lifelong friends, and now talking at the intersection. Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, mm-hmm. Alfred Street Baptist Church, yeah. Sister churches, we like to say uh, Alfred Street is Wheeler Northeast, right. yeah, East, yeah, right, East right, Coast, right, right. and uh, Wheeler Avenue is Alfred yeah, Street Southwest. Southwest. <laughs> and so we have these gentlemen talking with us. This is part two of a conversation that started. And let me give a shout out and a thank you and a God bless you to my brother, counterpart, Reverend Ty Jones. Uh, did a phenomenal job last time in the conversation. So now we are on the avenue. Yeah. We're in at home base, Pastor. This yes. is your territory, Praise okay? The yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I have the privilege and thank you so much for it. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about doing this because I have listened to the first interview twice. I listened twice because I knew that you would have some really cool things to say, some things to laugh about, <laughs> uh, insight, wisdom. But then I was also listening for the pieces that we might want to dig a little bit deeper. Mm. The spaces where I know there are individuals who are listening And you have a lot we can glean from. And I tried to put myself in the space of those who might want to have this seat. How could I represent Mm. some young people, some men, senior pastors, associate ministers, women who might not ever get this opportunity? So I'm representing a lot of folks right here. (laughs) I'm very afraid. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I think we asked everything we need to talk about. So So this is my little book. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's dig in. All right. We ready? Yeah. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Launch out into so the deep. So first of all, launch out into the deep. I like that. These such preachers. <laughs> such preachers. I want to go personal first uh, before we get into the bigger things, because you are first human beings. Mm. You're a man. You are person. And I want to talk a little bit more about some things that I think are helpful for everybody. But before I talk about preacher, pastor, I just want about person, follower of Jesus, sure. believer. Tell me what is your, what has been the most significant part of your spiritual formation? Take me back mm-hmm. to what's been the most meaningful part of your journey, just as a Christian. It's difficult to give one <laughs> yeah, right. answer to that because of the journey that has been so long and varied. Um, so please pardon me for not giving just one. No, it's But um, I think one of the most significant things for me is having the background, the foundation that I had in Chicago at Emmanuel in my home with the other sister churches uh, from the Emmanuel uh, from the Emmanuel group of sister churches, including uh, the church out of which Salem district. Yes, uh, the district (laughs) association (laughs) out of which we'd come. Uh, So I think that foundation is so significant because I draw from it today. I mean, almost every you know sermon has some reflection of what happened when in my childhood, in my teenage years. But I think beyond that, my the broadening of that foundation, the deepening of it, when my theology was stretched um, at Fisk University and then at the Interdenominational Theological Center. Okay. I think that stretching to understand that God was a whole lot bigger than the God that I learned about Mm -hmm. in Chicago, Mm -hmm. uh, the God that I thought I knew Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a child, to find out that God was so much bigger, so much diverse, so much more diverse. Mm -hmm. Um, That that has been the blessing for me. And if I was to give a tertiary response, it would be to come to Houston, Texas. I have to have have three points, absolutely. I was alliterated, man. Oh man, that's how I'm 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 (laughs) alliterated. But the third part would be coming here, And having my preaching expanded mm. after hearing the Reverend Bill Lawson, the Reverend oh, William Lawson. Alexander Lawson. So I had a picture of preaching and several pictures of preaching, to be sure, when I came here. And I had my own preaching in development mm-hmm. when I came here. But to add to my preaching another perspective, another style, and to learn of another pastoral perspective mm-hmm. was a blessing to me. 
because the, the pastoral perspective of Pastor Lawson was different from what I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And to add that to my 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 toolkit yes. was most important for me. Yes. So I, those those three things. Yes. I'm gonna come back to you. Sure. I'm trying to figure out how to literate mine. <laughs> You've had time. Well, you had time. time. This is just talk. You, your talk. person. Yeah. Your, how are you doing know, with it? I, I sometimes lament that I see young men and women called in ministry mm. who didn't have that kind of grounding. It wasn't mm-hmm. by, that they didn't love the Lord or were, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe just a generation ahead of them. We were forced to go to church. Yeah. And I may have despised Sir. and loathed it as a child. But it was so preparing us for what was going to come that neither one of us could know. Um, I'm talking about Sunday, I'm talking about midweek, I'm talking about Baptist training union, Sunday school. You know, we went to district meetings. I don't think people even know don't what know a what district what meeting is. is. <laughs> I, you can't get any more punitive to a teenager <laughs> than to make them sit at a district, district church meeting, right? It's, it's about as bad as it gets, right? So when you're 13, 14, you're going, man, what in Jesus' name is this? The only fun thing was probably the state convention. Yeah, we used to go to state convention, travel. state congress, yeah. Yeah. right? And, and that's a week long experience. Uh-huh. And a very different experience of church. We're yeah. talking about like a thousand mm-hmm. like young people f- from around the state mm-hmm. gathering together. We look forward to because they're people Absolutely. we knew right. that right. we would see every year. And, and he was and, the president. One of the, right, one he was director of music, right? So, <laughs> oh, like, oh, like oh, we were so running the joint. We were running the joint. Right. Yeah, we, we the joint. Yeah, 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 but growing up with a lady like an Ethel Mars, who would tell you you don't clap? She would have a fit if Clapping we clapped. In and that's what not, belongs in church. Yeah, amen. amen. That's all that we was. Were, so she we would were, ask oh, the question. Well, we were responsible to say wow. amen. amen. That's all. Yeah. So just that kind of training yeah. was critical. And then oh, from my. there, for me, it would be all these moments of almost crisis where God mm-hmm. redirected my steps. Wow. Um, yeah. Every every time my theology was broadened. It was crisis. Wow. Uh, it has never been joyful, pleasant. Oh, really? things are well. It's always, wow. yeah, like life and death is in the balance. Stuff's about to hit the fan. You know, you got to make difficult decisions. So I think these moments like speaking to Sam Proctor on a campus at Duke when I was in medical school and him telling me that's not where you belong. Yeah. Um, getting to Springfield, Massachusetts in the most crazy way, spending 10 years in what I thought was the background of ministry while I'm watching all my friends get escalated. Um, and then most recently would be the sabbatical moment mm-hmm. when I realized that my pastoral journey was not synonymous with my walk with Christ. Amen. That I was pastoring and preaching, but still really empty and far away. And I had to take some time out of the pulpit mm-hmm. to reconnect with God. Mm-hmm. And since then, I really think my preaching, my theology has stretched even more. But all these moments of crisis mm where the Lord was kind of like, no, you're going in the wrong direction. This is good. I appreciate you both sharing that. And I want to peel it even more. What do you do? Give me something practical that shapes your (coughs) spiritual formation right now. So you talked about your foundation a lot and then these Mm -hmm. moments of crisis or these um, broadening, expanding kind of your capacity. But what does it look like right now as God is shaping you? If somebody wanted to know, how are you maintaining your spiritual health? Yeah. For me, there's a lot of reading involved now. I'm enjoying picking back up works of theology that kind of help me see God as much bigger than mm-hmm. the Baptist box I put God in mm-hmm. when I started learning yeah, the box. traditional mm-hmm. Baptist yeah. box uh, that I put God in. Um, I'm enjoying online ministry and being able to watch some of the preaching I enjoy, right? So during the week, I can pull up Cosby or Tolan Mar- Morgan or Otis Moss or Terry Anderson or Ralph West. Like these are the preacher, Gina Stewart, the preacher that I just go to, to be fed, you know, and prior to this pandemic, that really was not an avenue I researched or Mm -hmm. uh, would Mm -hmm. plug into. Mm -hmm. Um, And then finally- another crisis. Yeah, right, 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 (laughs) leading down that road. And then finally learning to take better care of myself and step away from church Mm -hmm. uh, to do the things I enjoy. So I believe in fairway meditation. Me and God hook up on the golf course. And it, Fairway, man. That, that's right. That's I meet good. brother and sister Fairway at least <laughs> once a month uh, when I'm out of town. And, and, and that's good for me. It's healthy for me to be in a less stressed place where I feel like I can just talk to God, hear God, be mm-hmm. in fellowship with uh, good Christian men and women. So that's, that feeds my soul. Good, good. Yeah. So I have morning meditation, morning I devotion. Know. That's my thing. Uh, when I get up, uh, my music is, it is vital 
to the beginning of my day. I think it it makes it it tempers my attitude. It uh, helps me to be focused. Mm-hmm. So my morning meditation, especially if I'm in you know in the gym. So if I get to the gym before I get to come uh, to the office or wherever I'm going, that makes me it centers me it focuses me and uh, i'm a scripture reader so the, the the scriptures that flow for me on any given day um and mine is not as regimented as some people's are uh, some people's um, modes may be i i just like to hear what god is saying in that moment and sometimes my music leads me to passages of scripture that help me to be focused for the day but that's an everyday thing for me. I really think my attitude is shifted. If it's a bad attitude, it's shifted to a better attitude by that music that gets me going every single day. Um, Interesting. And so that that's how I that's how I roll. Uh, how I prepare for worship. I have yeah. my uh, my children laugh at me because I have playlists uh-huh. depending on what's going on in my life. Mm-hmm. I got one that's for morning worship. Others worship prep. That's what I'm getting ready to go to church. Get ready yeah, to preach. Yep. I've got one for the gym. It's the gym mix, and most of it is gospel, and it's fast-paced gospel. Uh, so it's a lot of a lot of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, and depends that, on the mood, that depends, depends on the mood, depends on where I am. And there's one called the Blood. So that gives me ready for first Sunday. Oh yeah, my goodness! <laughs> you are yeah. like really, yeah. Deep it's, it's something else. It's it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah, mine ain't Christian. <laughs> yeah, see, he, 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 but you know, Yang. So, and I, I noticed that in the last interview, there are so many ways that you, of course, what thirty plus years of friendship are in step, lives parallel, Mm -hmm. then you're very different. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Very, very different. I've had the privilege of watching from afar and actually meeting you close around the same time. So just seeing what you called uh, feeling like you were on the backside of ministry while Mm -hmm. your counterparts were were excelling or or moving up. Mm -hmm. And now to be here in front of you is interesting because over those years at different points and seasons, you can see how your lives really have stayed kind of yeah. in step, although they're very, very different paths. Now, what I also recognize here is that both of you, I know, love music and worship, right? Mm-hmm. But your first response was about music mm-hmm. and yours was about space mm-hmm. and center. And it seems like that's really well, you know, who you are. music for the first half of my life. I know, life. that's why I said so that. Yeah, that's yeah, why I said it's, it's in you. It's yeah. like it's, it's in your pores. It's, yeah. it's yeah. all about who you are. Yeah. That was good. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Let me go back even further. I want to know if you can bring it, because I love hearing these stories. <laughs> tell me about your call experience. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, tell me, how did you know? Yeah. Well, I called Cosby and told him <laughs> that the Lord had need of him. And he prayed. I prayed over him. <laughs> Me and his mother laid hands on him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said there were certain engagements I wasn't going to take so he could have them. Oh. And, uh, you know, he, he's been my backup ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his mother is so proud of him. <laughs> so, proud, so proud of you, guys. So God bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel the love. Um, so I, I knew, I think, I don't know if Doc will say the same thing, but I knew from childhood that I was going to preach. I'm not that guy who okay. ran from preaching and there, or, that, or that preacher that says, no, nah, I didn't want to do this. I'm the guy who wanted to do it. I would play preacher at home. You were that kid. I was that kid. I was, oh. I was that kid. I would have a whole church service in my bedroom uh, by myself uh, and envision congregations, hundreds of thousands of people. I would what? envision that. Wow. Uh, so I'm that weird church kid that really knew that um, this was going to be for, for wow. me. I wanted it. I was not running from it. I never said no to God. Um, and then when God chose me, uh, called me, and I knew I was called. I was in a friend's room, and and on the wall was a poster, a football, when you put posters on your room walls back in the day, mm-hmm. it was a poster of a football player, and there was a caption. He had written his, signed his autograph and then wrote a verse of Scripture Underneath it, he wrote the, the, the passage. It was First Timothy, something, something, something. And uh, I just went back and read it. And when I read it, the verse said, flee youthful lusts. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was real concerned about that. What are you saying, God? But then the Lord said, keep reading. I read the rest of the chapter. He said, keep reading. I read into the next chapter. And the words were, preach the word. 
be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Um, it said, do the work of an evangelist. All of that passage wow. of scripture was my call. And this mm-hmm. is when I knew the Lord had called that me. Moment, yeah, that's... that moment was when I knew the Lord had called me. Yeah. Wonderful. And then I told Pastor Curry, and he said, okay, so what are you going to do different? I said, preach. <laughs> he, <laughs> said, he said, are you going to be a singing preacher or a preaching singer? Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. He pushed and you to... He pushed me in that very moment. Teenager sitting across from a very daunting brother, man, who has been my leader, spiritual leader all my life. He said, are you going to be a singing preacher or a preaching singer? And I, in those years, I wasn't processing right, right. all of that. Of course, now I, 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 I want to be a preacher, preacher, uh, who sometimes sings. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, Thank uh, you. yeah, that was my story. All right. I, I wish I knew. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, being raised in church with a dad who's a pastor. Yeah. The one thing I was clear on is that I did not want to pastor or preach. What? Um, I saw the sacrifices my dad made. My dad was faithful to church that never grew above 200 members. Um, I didn't like this idea that you get up in the middle of the night to go pray for someone in the hospital. <laughs> and, you know, I'm grateful that my dad was a successful business person, but church never, like, made money. Right? There was that 200 members. There was, that, there was, there was This model of successful, mm-hmm. like, full-time ministry is very rare mm-hmm. in their early 80s, mm-hmm. you know, at least for our exposure. So I want to make money. What the hell we preaching? I want to make money, oh, right? I, you're right. Like oh, the my. Lord called me to be wealthy. Yeah, yeah. I, I want, so that was the last thing I wanted to do. Fast forward real quick. 1989, it is September. A few of my friends, um, including someone who's very dear to me, Melanie Palmer, they were out one night and in a car accident. Mm-hmm. And three of them died, but Melody didn't. And that really kind of messed me up, right? Here's my friend in a hospital. The hospital they put her in was the University of Chicago Hospital, which was right connected to my school. So I could go see her. And I started to go see her in the mornings before school, whenever I had a break, before basketball practice and after. And I was praying for her. Mm. I don't think I ever really prayed before then. I mean, I said the words. I learned Lord's Prayer. I, I knew now I lay me down to sleep. But never had I prayed for God to do something. Mm-hmm. So it was um, October 27th, 1989. Melanie had been in the hospital for almost a month in an induced coma because they were trying to heal some swelling on her brain. And... Uh, mm. She sat up and called my name. Now, at 50, that still moves me. Yes. Imagine what it does when you're 17, right? You're like, whoa, wait, what? So she literally sat up out the coma and, and said, Howard, lay back down. And then she woke up, right? So that messed me up. And right? I'm like, woo. I didn't think I had anything to do with it, but it really did mm. affect me. Yes. That next Sunday, the, so that was a Friday, Sunday, I went to Zion Hill Baptist Church. Antoine Funches was preaching his trial sermon. Oh, wow. Antoine's dude grew up with us. We know him well. He's married to a friend of ours now. He was preaching his trial sermon, and I went to support him. And all while he was preaching, I kept seeing myself in the pulpit. (laughs) And I was like, okay, is this arrogant, Howard? Like, what? Like, (laughs) this isn't what we want to do. So I was trying to figure it out, and I, um, I called my dad. Because I got home early. My dad was still preaching. He had an evening service. I said, Dad, I need to talk to you when I get home. I've never known my dad get home that quickly. Wow. He walked in, and the first thing Alvin John Wesley said was, who's pregnant? Like, <laughs> that's what he thought I wanted to talk to him about, right? That's, who, that's what he thought I wanted to talk to him about. Like, who's pregnant? Like, that ain't what I meant. I'm wrestling with Jesus. That's He's about who's pregnant. So, so, so that was, that was because of <laughs> Like, who's pregnant? I was like, Dad, yeah, that was not uh, what I called for. <laughs> so we prayed. He called my mom, and one thing led to another. And I gave my trial sermon November 29th, 1989, and we're preaching ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now, interesting, in, in addition to his story, I never wanted to be a pastor. And I tell everybody that. I never wanted yes. to be a pastor. Mm. I didn't want to preach to the same people every week. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I was going to be creative enough. I didn't think I'd you know, be able to sustain that or maintain something like that. I wanted to preach. when I Because I read to you from that passage, 
do the work of the evangelist. I, yes. I was like, I yes, that. Lord, I'm with that. Mm -hmm. That means I get to travel, I like to go everywhere I want to go. And so I told the Lord I didn't want to be a pastor. I said, I'll be an assistant pastor. So when I got here, I was like, God, answers <laughs> my prayer. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, Please. go, God. <laughs> Sweet deal. I said, I, you know, I can, I, I don't have to preach the same people every week. Mm -hmm. I can go, go, come mm -hmm. as I as as I'm led. And uh, Pastor Lawson, when as soon as I got here, he said, start a night service, which mean I had, meant I had to Damn. preach the same people every week. And I was like, yeah. come on, Jesus, you gave me what I asked for. Then you're gonna do this. That's a sneak attack. And uh, so. Uh, that was, of course, preparing me uh, for what would happen six years later. But I, you know, I never wanted to pastor the Lord's people. And ever. now here you both are in the very yeah. thing you never, ever wanted to do. Wanted to. Well, you know, say if you want to make God laugh, tell yes, me. Yes, absolutely. And I see the consistency because that's yeah. definitely a tragic moment. Yeah. But God has a way of grabbing our attention, too, sure. in the way that we oh, yeah. need it. And all of us have burning bushes, yes. Yes, yeah, right, man. Where something's meant to turn your attention mm -hmm. from what you think you're going to do to what God's calling you to do. Yep. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm I'm curious about, and and so I have so many things as you talk. I'm thinking about ways to come back to that statement, come mm -hmm. back to that statement. Time will not allow us to get into all of it, but I do want to ask you about another personal area of growth that I think is very important these days because we hear a lot about cancel culture. And in and church hurt mm -hmm. and conflict. And I think working with young adults, as I do and have for some time, there are a lot of ways that it's hard to get people to work through conflict without feeling that they have to cancel everybody or just, you know, peace out. And we have all of that. How have you worked through your life's journey knowing that, number one, there are some people you can't cancel out because they're going to be at your church and they might be the ones that you want to leave, but God said no. Um, help us as Christians. We're not pastors. So just help us understand that journey. But then talk about what that means for you personally, having to work through some of that conflict. You know, people church hurt. And because some, some people think about church hurt only from the point of, of reference of the con congregant. Mm -hmm. They don't always know that sometimes pastors hurt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Often pastors hurt. Help us with that. Just as a man, how do you work through that? Probably a bunch of different angles, but I'm going to tell you what's most critical for me. And I, I, I can only tell you that I've evolved into this as I'm now at 50, and I probably start putting it into practice at 45. But okay. I was one who avoided certain things and realized that avoidance never leads to deliverance. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I live by now that we try to press in our church, it's one we have a couple core principles that we operate by, mm -hmm. and this is the one, that, the main one to me, this is the most critical teaching of Jesus mm -hmm. that is ignored within relationship. Uh, everything Jesus says is important. I love John 3, 16, John mm -hmm. 10, 10. You know, Jesus wept. That's my favorite blessing of food. You know, I know it all. But, but the one that I think is the most critically overlooked is Matthew 18, 15. Mm -hmm. If you have an ought yes, against sir. a brother or sister, go and tell them. And one of the things I've lived by that we now force in our church is to have courageous conversations and address the issues on the table as opposed to just acting like something didn't happen right. or you weren't offended by it or weren't wounded by it. We have to share it. So our deacons have been trained how to practice. If Marcus comes to Lakeisha and said, I got a problem with Howard, your response would be, have you told Howard first? Yes. Right, that, that, that we try to stop the rumor mill, mm -hmm. we try to stop the hurt. Let's talk to one another first and give each other, because that builds relationship. It, it builds the space where you can be healed, yes. where we can express our hurts. So for me, that's helped tremendously in these last five to seven years of my pastoral journey, to be able to say, hey man, can we talk for a second? And this is usually our preface it. I trust our relationship enough mm. to be honest with you. That's good. Right? That's good. And if this is offensive, I don't mean it to be, and maybe we don't reconcile, but I have to give it a chance. I have to try Matthew 18, 15. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> so conflict for me um, has been... It's not been as overwhelming as some might suggest it has been for them. I'm sitting here trying to think, <clears throat> excuse me, of those moments where significant conflict has come into my life. 
and I've had to deal with it. Of course, we have these brushes of challenge, but uh, church hurt. Yeah, I've had a little bit of that. I've had a little bit of that. And I've had to grow through it uh, through forgiveness. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I have learned the practice of forgiveness because I have needed the practice. I have mm-hmm. needed forgiveness. So it is much easier for me to provide forgiveness at this point uh, because I have had to, to, to request it mm-hmm. uh, on more than one occasion. So I think the practice of forgiveness helps me to move past stuff. I'm not a grudge holder. I'm not that guy who is going to remember 10 years ago when you wronged mm-hmm. me. Um, and, and there have been some preachers who have wronged me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there have been some preachers who have, who have offended my, my generosity. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've had to grow through it, grow through it and try not to, every time I see that person or those people, remember the offense. Uh, so I think the practice of forgiveness mm-hmm. has been my my biggest growth edge, uh, and has helped me to to serve the Lord's people yeah. who often need forgiveness. You know, if I can jump real quick, because I, yeah. I hear you say it about forgiveness, I've also had to learn that the closure I need will not always come from yes. me. Yes, right. That it's quite possible that the offense or whatever is hurt you will not be able to address or to help me heal from. Mm-hmm. And I've had to learn a few things in life, move on without the closure. And this is one of my most critical lessons, learn to take the loss, mm-hmm. right? That there's something valuable about learning to say, that didn't go my way. That person and I are not to, will not be related anymore. This did not happen the way I want. Now let's see how God's moving in tomorrow, yes. as opposed to continuing to try to fix yesterday when that may not be possible, mm-hmm. you know? You got to take the loss. Yeah. And move forward. Yeah. yeah, move forward. So let me ask this. Let's let's shift a little bit. You've said also, uh, quoting, I think, Pastor Curry, your father in the ministry, you've lived a charmed life. I like to use the word so blessed, favored, and all of that. With that, what do you think is the responsibility? Uh, you chimed in as well in the last interview saying both of you have that, had that experience. What do you think is your responsibility if we say to whom much is given? much is required. How does that shape the way you look at where you are now and the next few years as you look for, towards legacy? That is a challenging f- statement for me, to whom much is given, much is required, only because so much has been given to me. <laughs> and I say that because it is often difficult for me to say no. Mm. Uh, I have, people ask me all the time, uh, you know, what are your boundaries with regard to who where you go preach and I, I just go. I, and uh, sometimes a friend of mine mm-hmm. uh, laughs at me and mm-hmm. talks about me. Uh, I'm not going to call any, any names, but uh, you know, some people mm-hmm. have the tendency to-, to People uh, close to you. I mean, maybe close you close know. to me, proximity right. and <laughs> relationship. I got to uh, preach Sunday, don't forget. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Why do you do this? Why do you do And it's just, well, I love it, first of all. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that. I, I love to do what I do. And so it's difficult for me to say no. And I think, um, I wrestle with that verse because I need to figure out uh, how much is required. Ooh. How much is required? Oh, yeah. as opposed to optional. Yeah, well, just... yeah. When, when, mm. when does requirement cease? And this is just because you like doing what you do, and and you don't you don't know when to say no. That's good. Yeah. I'm I'm glad to hear you say that. That's yeah. that's a prayer point I hear. Right. <laughs> Pray for me, please. I will. All right. Yeah. I think in this space of my life, my concern is being a good steward mm-hmm. of that charm, that favor, that grace, particularly protecting the witness of the name Howard John Wesley. Sure. Um, quick story, real quick. Worst day of my life, literally. Um, my wife and I were going through a divorce and a lot of rumor comes out around that. You know, public figure, pastor. And of course, every rumor is somebody's pregnant. Um, it gets onto a... Uh, a blog, and this famous blogger, who I will not name because I don't want to give any more credence right. to it, starts putting out, oh, I heard there's someone pregnant. What are y'all hearing? And there's all this chiming uh-huh. in from people who don't even go to my church. But I heard this, heard that. And what they're really doing is projecting what they thought they know about other preachers because yeah. now we're all the same. Yeah, we're all the same. Right? 
Worst day of my life, my son, who's named after me, my oldest, has to do a research project. And they're teaching them how to do online research. And the assignment was Google your name. So he Googles Howard John Wesley, and the first hit that comes up is this blog. And my eight-year-old son, I don't know if I cry or curse, comes home and says, Daddy, do I have a sister? Right? Broke me. But it made me realize how important it is to protect the name, right? Because he wears that name. So I think legacy now, and by legacy, it starts with my two sons. Mm -hmm. And then legacy is about Alfred Street. So the charm, the favor, the grace, I've got to manage it well so that my sons can walk in it and not be ashamed. And Alfred Street can live in the pride of saying, we've got a good pastor, right? So, so I can't drive five Bentleys, right? And have a private jet because it ruins the name. It hurts the brand. And being able to understand that, that that's the greatest gift God has given. I mean, it's one of the Proverbs that a good name is to be had above mm-hmm. silver and gold, yes, right? So I'm trying to learn to steward that name so that I can leave it for my kids and leave it for Alpha Street in a way that they're proud to see that name. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a heavy, heavy, heavy responsibility. Yeah. A lot goes into that. I've had to reduce my crowd. Um, growing up, it was just, in, in Chicago, it was just three of us. It was three of us, young preachers. Chicago Emmanuel family, mm-hmm. about six brothers, great friends still to this day. When I became pastor, Mm -hmm. that crowd started to expand. Mm -hmm. And one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. There's too many people. And too many people who consider themselves close to me and may not have the proper intent with that proximity. So for the last couple of years, few years, I've been reducing the crowd intentionally. trying to get back to three, two, I'm okay with that. I don't need a whole bunch of people around me for me to feel good. You know what I found out, man, in our position? Mm -hmm. Proximity to, I'm not gonna say us, because I don't don't think either one of us sees ourselves as the way other people do, but proximity to Cosby gives me currency. Mm. It's like, it's money to me that I can now use within Wheeler Avenue, that the closer I am to him, the more authority I have in this body of Christ. And that's where it's been hurtful. We yes. realize that people are not protecting you, they're protecting the investment of being close to you right. and then being able to utilize that for their own yes. desires because it grants them authority, yes. right? Whoever's or perceived close, authority. Right, perceived authority. Mm-hmm. The closer I am to you, the less you can say no to me, right? Because I represent him. That's true. I don't want to hang out with people anymore. <laughs> I just don't. <clears throat> I don't. Um, preachers hang out a lot. Mm-hmm. And I, I realize with the responsibility I have, I can't do that. It's yeah. not that I don't want to. I don't like fellowship. I love fellowship. Yes. I can't do that because it can be used for, with nefarious intent. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Somebody I, told me just, excuse me, somebody ahead. told me just yesterday or today that they, or to this morning, that they know Cosby very well. I can call him. I don't even know the person. Mm. I don't know the mm. person. And a preacher told me this morning, yeah, he told me I could call Cosby anytime. I can get to him. And this is the guy, the guy who tells me this, the guy I went to seminary with, who mm-hmm. is my friend. And uh, this person is just, you know, they just make up stories. And yeah. that, that can be hurtful. That can be frustrating because you never know what the stories are that are out about, out, out and about on you. So it's, it's, it's a bit challenging. So with all of the wonder of this charmed life, there come challenges. Bless, yeah, yeah there come challenges. It does. I would even add to, um, I don't know how much or how often you get to talk about this with people who are close to you, even on your staff or the true circle, because there are experiences that some of them may have that are very similar. People try to get to your executive, your assistant, your staff, because they think that's a stepping stone to get to you and wield that same type of perceived authority. Um, It's just a reality of where we are. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask these questions. I want to turn it a little bit because we started talking about church and pastoral leadership. I started with the person, the man, and um, we know that the church, of course, we hear it all the time, is an organization and organism. 
right? If you could go back to 2019, six months before the world shut down, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would you do differently based on what you know now? Or is there anything that you would do differently? Whenever I think of the church shutting down, I, I clearly remember I had a month left in sabbatical. <laughs> and this dang old pandemic, like, it, you know what it was like? Not only did it snatch me out, it's kind of like being startled awake. Imagine being oh, peaceful yes. and asleep yes. and someone slapping you. Yes. You just jump up like, what the heck? Uh, you yes. know, that's the way the pandemic did. Like, I was, I was fine. It took me a month to get out of pastoral mode. Yes. A month to reconnect with Rest the Lord. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then I'm slapped like, Pastor, we got to get you back. Um, and I don't think I would have allowed myself to run back in with the panic mm. that, that we faced coming into it. Because um, now I know we'll get through it. Yeah. Right? Where it's, I would have preached differently, too. I would have preached more about wandering wilderness experiences or taught more with our leadership on that, that we are in uncharted yes, yes, spaces. Yes. There's no right or wrong. There's, we're going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And can we be patient and flexible mm-hmm. to just take God one step at yes, a time? Yes. Follow the cloud. <laughs> and stop comparing ourselves to others. Yes. Right? Which was a real dilemma. I saw what they're doing at Wheeler, but that's not Alpha Street. The call at Wheeler is different than Alpha Street, and we've got to find our way. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely would have run out. I would have, taught, I would have prepared leadership better, um, and I would have taken our time to really just say, because this pandemic has helped us really think about who are we? Mm-hmm. What's yes. at the core of our identity as a church, and what do we protect, and what are we willing to be flexible on? Right. Pivot. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, pivot. Don't be afraid to pivot. Don't be afraid to shift, change course. Um, I'm grateful for the team that I have because the team uh, that, that we have here at the church helped me to understand that I was walking into a space that I wasn't prepared for, that I wasn't accustomed to, that I wasn't going to like. Uh, our staff meetings, as you will recall, um, you all tried to push me into a space I wasn't <laughs> ready to go in. We were help. We were supporting. <laughs> yeah, we were you, helping you were and encouraging. You were pushing. You were shoving. And, we were being uh, like the Holy Spirit. You kicking. Kick 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, because our journey was different. Everyone went straight to um, the cameras and the empty sanctuary. And I was not prepared for it. I was not ready for that. I didn't want to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember. I told everybody I didn't want to do it. And uh, at the time... Our team was like, well, everybody's doing it. I said, I, I get that. I'm okay with that. I don't want to do it. You um, did say that. Awesome. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Why are we not doing it? Because I don't want to do it. And um, after a little while of that, you know, the saints were like, you're going to do you're it. You're going to do it, forever. <laughs> and, uh, and the Holy Ghost was like, hey, you you got to do it. And I knew I had to, we had to do it. But I wasn't ready for the pivot. I wasn't ready. I wasn't. I wasn't ready personally, uh, and I don't think I was ready psychologically. Mm. And so I had to to prepare for it. I had to prepare for it uh, in a way that others may not have. Uh, and I probably should have done, maybe I should have done what others did, but I just wasn't ready for it. And so I didn't allow anyone to push me into it until I realized that we were going to be in this yes. unique space yes. for an extended period mm-hmm. of time. Mm-hmm. But what the process that we engaged helped me to do was to prepare myself sermonically to respond to the pandemic. Mm, mm. Uh, so I was able to process the pandemic a whole lot more uh, so that when I got into the preaching mode, and I, I looked at my preaching, my preaching professor, Dr. Carolyn Knight, gave me an extremely kind compliment with regard to the pandemic preaching mm. uh, that was seemingly different from the pre-pandemic preaching. And I think those, however many weeks or months that I took to get mm-hmm. ready, mm-hmm. centered me, yeah. allowed me to to think through some of the stuff that was going on in the world. Now, everybody didn't like it. I get that. But I think it helped me to be ready to somatically respond to what was going on in the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for that. Sometimes we just need to be still and yeah. 
process. So I'm going to have a little fun and then I'm going to turn back Let's to some of the heavy stuff. All right, all right. Yeah, had, yeah. Listen, yeah. man, I'm All the heavy crying. stuff is not done? We're not done? Mm-hmm. Good Lord. Mm-hmm. Like okay. I said, I know that this was going to be good for people. I mean, we can talk about a lot of church things and I know you all talk about these things mm-hmm. in conferences and when you go and talk to these groups at schools and all of that, but I've, I've never heard about Melody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the work to train your leaders in conflict re- resolution, and, mm. and we talk about the word, but do we actually do we Put in play, do yeah. this this specific thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right here? Mm-hmm. So that was good. I'm gonna throw out some words. Yeah. I want you to tell me the first, first thing. thing the word association. Yes. First I mean, thing that comes to mind. You know, it's my background, so I'm yes. trying. Yes. That's, that's yes. part of the reason why I'm, I'm trying to make you cry. And all right. Right. <laughs> but I really do. I want no, no. No explanation. Don't okay. go deep. Don't think too much. Just tell okay. me the first thing that comes to mind. Cool. All right. All right. We ready? Yep. Who's first? Cosby. <laughs> okay. Okay. You, you know first what? Thing came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're gonna do? We're gonna play like this. I'll say the word and I'll go. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Good. We're I ready. like games. This is good. All right. <laughs> Kanye West. Sell out. Strange. <laughs> Favorite Old Testament personality? Joseph. Joshua. Mm, okay. America. Barack Obama. God help. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite hymn that's on your heart? Oh, how I love Jesus. Come thou fount of every blessing. All right. All right. Favorite dance song. <laughs> Take my shackles off my feet. So I, I, I want to hear that. <laughs> to God be to go and oh pray. My pray. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. It takes two to make a thing go oh, right. Wow. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> You from my generation? Yeah, yeah you, because you were on the dance all the time. I, I, uh-huh. right, let's, let's, this is about you. Oh mercy! This is okay. About you. One more. Well, no, two more because I had one here. If you had your first choice of someone that you could spend fifteen minutes with, who would it be? Just 15 minutes. First can, choice. Can, can we just assume Jesus and then move on to like a different... Oh, yeah. Answer? I don't have to say Jesus. <laughs> no, you right? don't have to say Just to be okay. holy and sanctified. Okay. No, we don't have to say that. Yeah. First choice. 15, 15 minutes, all you got. Living or dead, who would it be? Malcolm X. Oh. Mr. Mandela. Mandela. Okay. My birthday buddy. That's so interesting. Both of us born on July 18th. Yeah. And I spent some time with him. Thanks to Rem Lawson. Cool. <laughs> he took me to see him when uh, he was here. But yes, he would be the guy I'd spend All 15 right. minutes with. Why Malcolm? I was, I've, I'm very intrigued by that moment in Black history, mm. knowing that I would have had difficulty siding with King. Right? That I would have been more on the, we protect, we're pro-Black, maybe not as militant as a Black Panther, but I saw a lot of wisdom in Malcolm X, and I really want to know about his transition from the nation into more orthodox Islam Mm -hmm. um, and where there was a possible merging of Christianity and Islam. Because I don't think it was a religious issue. I think it was more a political one that became religious in the separation. And a lot of us who have pushed Malcolm out the side because he wasn't pro-Christian. But I'd love to talk to him about what he saw, what it felt like to be betrayed, right? By your own, intriguing to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Ooh. Y'all right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me, let me, Calm let me turn. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I'm going to go back and then we'll, we'll close up with some fun. We're good on time. I think we have a little bit. Um, let me ask about this. We, we touched on a couple of things related to the pandemic and being online, having a shift and pivot. So my brother, Reverend Ty, dropped in and, and asked a few questions because I am closer to your generation. Not, you are not, our generation. <clears throat> you are we our the same generation. box. Really, <laughs> you are. You know that box where they ask you how old you are? We're in that same box. Yeah, well, go ahead. Box. Yes, yes, go you ahead. Know, you're talking about two, three, four years. We're the same box, Dax. Same box. 
edit, edit, edit. <laughs> okay, so I want to know what you see and how do you feel about what happened, what's happening now because social media has taken on such a very strong, it, it's almost a stronghold <laughs> on a lot that is happening in the church and in particular with younger preachers in what seems sometimes to be almost a drive to blow up. Mm-hmm. to self-promote, to become the next thing, mm-hmm. to get booked, celebrity, all of it. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking even with a tone of, but tell me your, what do you see and how do you relate to that? Or what would you say to those that you may find in that space? So my foundation by which I spoke at the top of this conversation disallows me to have an emphasis on self on promotion. Pastor Curry wouldn't have that. It's, it just wasn't yeah. a part of my of my development. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as self-promotion. No such mm-hmm. thing as as thinking more highly of myself. But Pastor, Law, Pastor Curry, as Dr. Wesley said in the last interview, has a way of making sure you never get too high. He has ways by which. Uh, he will come you know, tap he, me on the shoulder he, and yeah, say that. He, yeah, he, believes in, <laughs> he believed in public embarrassment oh to keep you. Oh. And I hate to use the words, but in your place. Okay. Uh, so I so so although you don't like it when you're going through it, it is a de- developmental thing. So I have real challenges with extreme self promotion. Um, I'm still um, I'm still more. Uh, dependent upon uh, your gift makes room for you mm-hmm. and brings you before great people. Uh, so that may be uh, one of the reasons I'm not on so- on social media. Uh, another one is because of my attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't get as much work done as I need would need to get done if I was on social media. But I, I see that. And it's, it just, it's, unnecessary involvement in other people's lives mm. um, and, or, or their pseudo life. Um, so I, I'm, I'm probably not the guy to ask about social media because I'm not really engaged in it, but I do have a problem with self-promotion that goes beyond just allowing God to put you in places and spaces where you are, you connect with people. Cause I believe in relationships. I believe in connections. That's how I got to Wheeler Avenue. Absolutely. Uh, so I have no problem with that, but when I'm always putting myself into the forefront, into the limelight for my own aggrandizement or promotion, I think I'm getting in God's way. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not really um, inclined to do that because God knows how to bring you back down. And it's not always pleasant. Wow. Yeah. I struggle with the question because I don't want to come across as the old guy <laughs> who thinks everything in the generation coming up after him is evil, right? Right. But fundamentally, I think social media has created the fallacy of instantaneous unmerited celebrity. Right. We have people who claim to be celebrities with no gift, no talent. And it seems to be an expressway on social media to it that now preachers have like launched onto. Cosby and I were just raised differently. Mm-hmm. Driving preachers around, like carrying bags, listening but not talking, and realizing that there's a service road that gets to the highway that leads you to prominence. But you, you gotta pay your dues. It was a Word of advice given to me by Joe Ratliff. Blossom where you're planted until you're transplanted. <laughs> right? Grow where you are. Mm. And when God sees fit, God will move it. Because if not, you're going to become frustrated mm. over a small thing that God is saying, can you be faithful over that first? Can you be faithful over 200 members? Um, you can't pastor 2,000 if you don't know how to love 20. Can you be faithful over it? And then the dire consequence of social media is this comparative, yes. right? That I see a snapshot of everyone else and I think that ought to be me. And it leads to frustration, which leads to unfaithfulness. So I think there's a, there's a danger in it. And kind of like you when you talk about self-promotion, one of the things I try to say to my daughters and sons in ministry, if I go to your page and I see all these selfies and everything the church promotes has to have your picture on it, what are you really selling? It's it's problematic for me if everything that has the name Alfred Street also has to have the photo of Howard John Wesley. And so my team knows Pastor doesn't like to see his picture on everything um, because we, we're promoting more than ourselves. But social media is self-promoting 
by its own definition. Instagram, Twitter, it's destroyed our ability to digest truth in more than 140 characters. Um, and now there are those who are becoming well-known in the kingdom on 140 characters. And the generation coming up that sees that and think that there's an express lane to that and will chase the vaunted blue check mark more than faithfulness Sir. in a congregation. There's Sir. nothing in the world like being loved by real people in your church. Skip what you see on social media. My, my dad used to be like this. There's nowhere in the world you can't go if you have 200 members who love you. Mm. If, if you know there are 200 folk who value, reverence, and respect you, you can go anywhere in the world. Not 200 followers, but 200 folk you built relationship with. Relationship. Yeah. This is good. I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned that the preacher pastor has devolved into a star role, star mentality, where everything has to be about preacher pastor. And the, the picture thing is, is fabulous. Um, our folk will, will tell you I have a difficulty with my picture being on things. Um, we've not even hung one in the church because it's just not the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, just don't yeah. have, I have difficulty with it. So I think we need to, if, when Jesus is the star, the, the, the main attraction, and however we get to laud him and applaud him, whoever's used to do that is, um, I think we build a stronger church. And Much not, stronger. Not, yeah, and not a, a, a stardom church. And a church that can survive transition. The real yes. test of, of large churches Speaks, is can they, can they survive? Yep. So the amazing testimony of Wheeler and Alfred Street mm -hmm. is that they both survive transitions yep. of legends. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Peterson is a legend of Virginia. Everyone knows Bill Lawson. Yep. But can Wheeler be bigger than Bill Lawson? Can mm -hmm. Alfred Street be bigger than John O. Peterson? And now they're going to ask the same question. Yep. Right. right. Is yep. Wheeler bigger than Marcus Cosby? Mm -hmm. And is the ministry of Alfred Street bigger than Howard John Wesley? Or does it die when you retire? Yep. And if so, then we have failed. Yep. We have failed. Yep. Absolutely. So you mentioned sons and daughters in ministry, some of the things you try to teach them. And I know both of you have plenty. <laughs> Praise many, the Lord. many have come Praise through. The Lord. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna twist and turn, I'm gonna pivot, pivot just a bit before we have to start, you know, wrapping up. And I would not be true to who I am as well if I didn't ask some questions just about how God has moved you forward as it relates to saying, being able to say sons and daughters. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The place of women in ministry. Um, I often do or I try to do a segment that I like to call from the other side because it gives me an opportunity to hear what the perspective on any given topic is from the other side, from the male part of, point of view. And so if I were to represent a few different women and we sisters talk quite a bit, um, I know a little bit about your journey, but I'd like to know what got you to the place you are now that you have women on your staff. Um, there is a difference in supporting and then being an advocate for. Talk to me a little bit about your journey and where you are, what got you where you are right now. So real quick, yeah, I, let me put in the theology. Real, so I was raised in a women don't do anything but speak from the floor. Like, mm -hmm. God rest my dad, but that, that's what he knew. That was the, the form of Baptist. I was raised in, uh, where women could be evangelists and missionaries, but they did not speak. So when I go to seminary and they put me in a room where all these women are like, oh, all y'all going to hell. Like, <laughs> like this, this ain't right. God, 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 God is not in this. God is not in No me. way. I know what my assignment is while I'm here. Oh, my. Um, so, but it's you know what so I like to do? So to seminary with that mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Assignment. Lakeisha, what, what grew me is the same thing. You remember... The Roman centurion who sees Jesus mm. dying and says, show you this man Surely, is the son of God. Yes. Everything in that Roman raised him to not believe that anyone on the cross could be anything other than a criminal. Right. How in the world does a man who's raised to support Roman values, Roman torture, has committed himself to Roman service, mm -hmm. look at a Jew hanging on a cross, and come to a conclusion the Jews didn't come to, that this man was the son of God. He sees something the crowds never did. For me, part of the answer is he got close. Mm -hmm. When you get close to people and see the suffering the system has enforced on them, it will grant you a new revelation when you begin to see their humanity and their divinity and their suffering. Mm -hmm. He gets close enough to see this man is human, this man's in pain, and this man is godly. What changed me was getting close. Getting close to women in ministry and knowing of the suffering that are 
that our patriarchy had enforced on them. Mm. Hearing their calling and knowing these women are really called the Lord. Being next to a Zena Jacques in seminary who could outthink me and outpreach me, but didn't have doors open simply because right. we didn't have the same genitalia. Right. Right. So that moved in my heart. Like, and, and if you see someone suffering and that doesn't move you, then you are whatever the term before the ism is. If it's racism, mm-hmm. if it's genderism, you are that. If you can see the suffering of a human being and know that your system put them there mm, and you don't care system. about it. Wow. The system you endorse has yes. led to their crucifixion yes. and you don't care about it. And so that I, I hope one of my legacies in ministry would be that I didn't just say I accepted women preachers, but really an advocate. Like yes. I won't go to programs now and preach on the, and I get in trouble with this. Guy puts out a flyer, 30 preachers. I'm the only, and they're all men. And I called him and said, you need to take me off and find a woman. Cause you can't tell me you got 30 preachers. They're all male faces and you can't find a sister to put on there. Take me off. Um, so it's not just talk. It's about real advocacy that we have to level the playing field in ministry because the Imago Dei is in both of us. Mm. Um, What's that? That, that, yeah. that, that right there. <laughs> the image of God. God. <laughs> yes, yes. Is, uh, that if Adam's made in the image of God and if we buy into the Eve is made from Adam, she comes from the same material, right? So yeah, I just want to be an advocate for it, but getting close changed me. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I was snatched out of my traditional Baptist box as soon as I got to Fisk University and met the dean of the chapel, a woman by the name of Dr. Chestana Mitchell Archibald, who asked me on the yard, Marcus Cosby, you mean to tell me that God said the prerequisite for preaching is a penis? And you're talking to a 17, 18 year old guy <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. who's now. Wait, saying, you're talking to me like, wait, you ain't supposed to use that word. <laughs> and she's a foreboding presence. She's a six foot two oh, thick my. black woman with a big old voice. Mark Scott, you telling me that God said that the prerequisite for preaching is a penis. So I had to re- I wrestled with that for a couple years. Uh, until she and I got very close and I became oh, her assistant. Close. <laughs> mm-hmm. close. Getting close. Close. Close, yeah. She and I got very close. I was her assistant for the last two years of my college life. Um, and so I think coming into contact with people who helped me to see another side. Her, her thing about preaching was, a preaching text, the text is a diamond and you keep turning it, keep turning it. You see different facets of the diamond. I think what she did for me in those years of my collegiate journey was to keep turning the diamond of ministry, Mm -hmm. of my understanding of what God does, who God is, how God operates. She kept turning that diamond until by the time I left there, I was like, God calls whoever God wants to call. Mm -hmm. God uses whomever God wants to use. It has nothing to do with me. And I cannot allow even the great foundation that I've built upon uh, to be the only level of my learning. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, since then, it's not even been an issue for me. I get to ITC and there's Dr. Carolyn Knight. She becomes my closest, uh, for close, close, closest yeah. friend and, and not just friend, but, but professor. And mm-hmm. we are, you know, in relationship with one another. So all of those kinds of things help me to, to understand that, that uh, if I understand God the way I think I do, mm-hmm that God is bigger than all the boxes that we put God in. And I have to be able to now not just accept, but advocate Mm -hmm. uh, for people. And it has to be demonstrated in my pastoral practices. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yes, uh, there are as many sisters on the preaching team as there are brothers. Yes, Yes. there will be as many sisters preaching as guests, as Mm -hmm. brothers. Uh, Yes, we will have a whole seven last words with just women preachers. And that's going to be the way it's going to be because I want to make sure that people understand that God is bigger than the gender box we put God in. I think when when I hear this part of any conversation, I'm also sensitive to the fact that it costs to be an advocate in this way. It, It costs to remove yourself from a lineup. It means that you are placed in a category with those people over there. And then you become, oh, all y'all going to hell. You know, it's, you're just wrong. Um, how would you encourage someone who might be in your position to continue working through 
and getting close because it, it does cost. I mean, that's something you don't have the opportunity to do. And then think about how many pastors have, you know, young children, smaller churches. Let's be very, very real. That's income. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line is that's that's my pocket. That's that's something that will impact others. And it's scary when you try to go out there to become an advocate, to say I support is one thing, but to actually do something beyond that. Um, what would you share? The unfortunate reality is that many pastors today would answer Dr. Mit- Dr. An- Chestana Mitchell Archibald's question with yes. Mm-hmm. And so my, my, my next turn then is to engage conversation. I want to have solid conversation, meaningful dialogue with people with whom I disagree. Meaning I don't have to remove myself from relationship with you because mm-hmm. I disagree with you. Mm-hmm. My responsibility now is have dialogue. Now, when that dialogue turns foolish, that, that's when I pull myself out of there. But I think constant and, and meaningful dialogue with individuals who disagree is a necessity uh, because I can't just say this is my position and then remove myself from anyone who has right. a differing position. I think we have to have conversation. There are people in this church who don't believe women should preach. I know that. Um, And I think if you're engaging in dialogue, uh, then you have at least the opportunity to bring a greater, a shine a greater light uh, Mm -hmm. on the on the opportunities uh, that are bigger than oneself. You keep using this word, and I think it's part of my foundation. Be a conversation reminding people that God is bigger. Yeah. Whatever God isn't bigger than, that has become God. God. Yep. So, if God isn't bigger than Leviticus, then Leviticus is God. If God's not bigger than Romans 1, then Romans 1 has become God. And living a life of teaching and preaching that people's experience is a valid form of understanding God, Mm -hmm. even if it challenges your traditional theology, which is where I think seminary is so important. It forces you to broaden your theology and understand that God's just bigger. Here's the God I know that I can advocate for, but I can't say, I can tell you God is here, but I can't say God ain't over there. That's the dilemma, that we don't have the right to say where God isn't and where God ain't. And hopeful that as a leader, you learn the value of courage, Mm. right? That leading is not finding out where the people want to go and then getting in front of them. Mm. Leading is discerning where God is calling you and your family as a church and saying, let's go this way. And then working that out in conversation with others, working it out in re- reappropriation of biblical text, working it out in getting close and seeing. When, so, you know, you know the first um, uh, Pentecostal woman. Uh, which one? Which city? Uh, not McCullough. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, San, San Antonio. Uh, Claudia Copeland? Copeland. Oh, okay. yeah. Claudia, Claudia Copeland. I heard Claudia Copeland preach in seminary. And I had a decision to make. Either God's using this woman, or this is the biggest blasphemous thing I've ever been to in my life, because she had me shouting. Right? <laughs> I, so, I called her in college. Right. I so it's either like, blasphemy or yeah. it's God, but it's, it, can't, it can't be in the middle. Right? And I decided to choose it's God. Because <laughs> my Good soul choice. was made happy. <laughs> yeah. Good choice. Yeah. She's the first woman to lay hands on me. Oh, oh, yes, Jesus. <laughs> Come on, Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Claudette Copeland. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Wow. She, those two women, Claudette Copeland and Jackie McCullough, yeah. and Renita Weems, uh, were the women I came in contact with in college. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, it blessed you couldn't myself. help but start turning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Blessed God myself. was yeah. after that. Yeah. And, and of course, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Archibald. Yeah. yeah. This has yeah. been so rich. I know I could go another 30 minutes because yeah. it, every question... I wanted to go to somewhere else that would take me a little bit deeper. Um, But we have to wrap up. And I must say thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for letting me dig and probe a little bit into some more personal spaces. But I think it's been helpful because we we don't get this opportunity. We don't get this chance to just be and chat and think about some things, go back in your memory and then think about moving forward. So I want us to be very succinct in this last question and just kind of wrap up. Preacher, succinct. I know. What is that word? That's, that's, uh, Keep it suit. short. Keep it short. <laughs> okay. All right. Whatever. We'll try. Um, I think I want to. I want to end on a high note. I was going to ask another question, but let me just ask these rapid fire again. Um, 
<laughs> Where would you like to live in the next 10 years? Same place. Okay. I'm not I'm not I'm not going anywhere. You're staying in Houston. Yeah. The next 10, 10 years. 10 yes. years. Yes. Okay. Give me 30. 30? 30 years. Somewhere with blue azure water. I'll go back to the first uh, I interview. remember it has yes, that water. Blue azure water okay. and wonderful climate. You can tell my sinuses are a problem for me. Okay. So somewhere where I can breathe easy and enjoy the water. All right. Yeah. 10 years and then 30. Well, in 10 years, I'll be, if the Lord says the same, finding my way out of Alfred Street. Oh, okay. Right. My, I've got about 11 more. I want to do 25 if it was God's will. And if God says the same, I'll be retiring. Okay. So 10 and 30 may be synonymous for me. Okay. Because um, it's going to be somewhere warm. It's going to be somewhere near a major airport and on a fairway. I want to be able to walk out of my house and go to tee box number one and play golf three days a week at okay. minimum. What are you reading right now other than the Bible and, you know, all the, okay. But what are you reading? What's the first thing that comes to mind? What are you reading? Right now I'm rereading Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Ooh, Discipleship. so good. Which is a big one. I tried to get into Thurman again, but he just confuses me. As much as I, every time I read a Thurman book, I'm like, and I'm stupid. Like I, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> you know, I, I need. I, I don't get it all. So I, I picked up a Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship. I'm rereading it. Very nice. I'm playing with Bonhoeffer because we're doing a discipleship yes. series. So I've been reading Bonhoeffer, but I've been marrying it or coupling it with Doctor in the Dances. Rereading Doctor in the Dances by Smith. Yeah. Nice. Yep. nice. And the Bible. Oh. And I don't want to discount that because too few preachers read the Bible. Okay. Shondo. Point, point taken. Yes. Absolutely. Shondo. Yes. Point well taken. I appreciate mm -hmm. that you do read the Bible. Yeah, man. It, you preach should be better if you actually read the that's, Bible. That's, that's yes. what my preacher friend said. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I, I believe that this has been a delight. Um, gosh. For many, we won't even we won't even get to hear all of it. But I do want to say you should leave a comment. <laughs> I do want to encourage you to make sure that you give us some more questions and that you affirm and put the you know clap and all that other emojis. Do all of that and share this. Pass it on because you know someone who would benefit because they're on a similar journey or they are aspiring to or they've just admired these preachers, these men, and have never had the chance to hear from their personal experience. And so I appreciate you. I thank you so much for giving oh, me the opportunity. You. I hope it's not the last in our lifetime. I, I would, and I mean that, I really mean that. I hope it's not the last in our lifetime. It has been a joy to see your journey. It has been a joy to watch from afar and then now to be a part of uh, an aspect of your journey and then to be this close again. I appreciate it. This is The Intersection. This is Alfred Street Baptist Church, Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, the great men that lead those congregations and I'm looking for Barney. Just trying to be an uncle. <laughs> oh That's my. what you told me, right? Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. And maybe there'll be a next time. We don't know. Oh but right my. now, bye. Peace.